9 a.m. on the dot. So we're going to let them take it away. Hey, I'm Josh Amato. I'm uh, been with, I'm Quakecraft's business development manager. I've been with the company for about 16 years. And I'm sitting here with uh, Professor Moisani today, inventor of all the Quakecraft product lines. Hey, uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. You know, we're glad to uh, start. This is a the first one of a series of uh, podcasts and webinars that we hope to host on for the marine solutions every uh, first Thursday of the month. So we'll see how, how this series go. And we also have some uh, other ones scheduled for like our uh, pipes and other activities, but we're really all excited about getting this thing going. We want to keep this pretty informal. So um, Put your questions in the chat room. Josh and I are going to be talking about different projects we're doing. And maybe, you know, we have some samples that if needed, we can show you. So you get a better idea of some of the products we have. And, you know, that's how it's got to go. And uh, I should tell you, I, you know, as Josh mentioned, I, for about 30 years, I was a professor of engineering. But those lectures that I give, I usually walk into the classroom with a set of notes. This is all free format. We're going to keep it casual and conversational. So. Uh, we probably today being the first one of these, uh, he's going to have some flaws. So forgive us for that, but we have will improve you know, in, in the next uh, one and so on. So. Yeah. So we first wanted to start out with our Marine division. Very exciting. We got through a pretty exciting summer, uh, different products. Uh, we have piling, seawall products, uh, but today we kind of wanted to Narrowing on some of the piling uh, things that we've done, or actually wanted to ask Mo what his favorite project he has going on right now, because uh, we have several. But yeah, we have uh, we have one really interesting project, you know, a pretty major one going on. Uh, it it is in Mexico. It's an industrial port uh, near in uh, the state of Veracruz in Mexico, where we are repairing a lot of. Uh, steel uh, piles in water and uh, pipe piles. Yeah. And, th and they are uh, severely corroded. In fact, in some of the cases, you have complete section loss in some of those. So that that's kind of an interesting project. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, just, but the interesting part to me is that the, what people were doing before to attend steel pipe piles was always involving some kind of welding. And so, uh, few years ago, we were in Texas yeah. dealing with the same thing. And uh, the big thing was, is the oil transfer uh, pipes up above. And they didn't want us to pull out hunt work permits. So, you know, can you chime in on that? Yeah, yeah so, so we developed this uh, new product for shear transfer or strengthening of um, steel age parts. Because, you know, typically when you repair a uh, pile and you pour some concrete or grout around it in the jacket, if you have a concrete or timber pile, there's pretty good transfer of load between those materials. But if you have a steel pile, then you cannot assume you have very bond between them. So we've developed some uh, ways of transferring that load without any welding, which makes it really a lot easier. You know, these products called uh, shear wrap and, and uh, shear clamps that we use for either circular parts or for H parts. You know, that's one of the things that, that we are using a lot of those in that job in Mexico. But, you know, uh, I thought maybe also talking about steel structures or steel piles, this is something that a lot of people can relate to is that, you know, how when you get a new uh, steel structure, even, brand, you know, in your house, for example, you, the, immediately before you put it in service, you put a paint on it. Well, the, the purpose of this paint is to create an impervious layer of protective layer on the steel to prevent any moisture and oxygen penetrating through it. Except that as, as you all have probably experienced, after a few years, the paint starts peeling off, you know, it cracks and it allows moisture to get in. So really, I, you know, sometimes I tell people that, well, at a minimum, forget about all of the strength that these FRP products add, but at a minimum, think of it as a, an impervious paint layer that is going to last for decades because these being reinforced with very strong glass or carbon fibers, 
they're not going to crack and peel off that easily. So that's really one of the like principles that we try to uh, apply in all of our jobs. Yeah. And in this project that you talked about, not only was the shear transfer calculated in the design, but as well as our system with the jacket. Yes. Uh, I mean, we did use, I think, mainly signatitious grout on this project, but the jacket itself was also in the calculation on this. Yeah, the jacket really, you know, that that's a good point. Uh, one of the things, you know, uh, I I have actually a little thing to show you here because, you know, I try to make these things really simple so you you everyone can appreciate them. So let's say whether, you know, you, you have concrete in it or it doesn't matter what material, but even if you take um, water, like if, you know, if you pour water on a table and it's just going to flow, it won't take any load. But if I take a, well, take that same water and pour it in a styrofoam cup like I'm holding here, and then I put like a plunger on top of this and start pushing down on this, and it is pretty tightly fitting so the water doesn't lose out. You know what happens as I keep pushing down vertically on this, this takes, uh, it keeps on taking load and load. Ultimately, you reach a point where this styrofoam cup is going to bust open and break. So what, what we are doing is you're putting the load vertically, but the load is being resisted by the strength of this styrofoam cup. And if I do the same thing, for example, so let's say if I put this and it goes, you know, 50 pounds is going to break the styrofoam cup. Now, if I put the same, do the same thing with, a, uh, with an aluminum can and I put the same, you know, start loading that, this would take a lot more load before you break the aluminum because aluminum is a lot stronger than obviously Maybe so we can see that and I can do the laminate. Yeah. And then I just kind of give you guys a quick demonstration that's going around itself. So here, what we do also, so like when we wrap this a couple of times and glue it to itself, now we have to say that I, I can't be doing it. Like this is a very Michelle. strong, you know, think of it like a very strong uh, no. So, you know, you make, a, you make a two ply shell like this now. Now, this can take a lot of vertical load. And as the concrete near failure, it, you know, it dilates and it wants to push outward. This confinement effect or the confining force that the jacket provides allows the column to or tile to take a lot more vertical load compared to a jacket that comes in, say, two half shells and you have a seam that you connect you know, in, uh, on site. So that's really one of the, and also keep in mind again, that you know, going back to my example of paint, when you have this system that is now wrapped around itself a couple of times, if you look at this, when I turn this around, there is really no point of entry for any oxygen or moisture to attack what is uh, below this or, or the pile. So this is really why, you know, it becomes a, a long lasting impervious shell uh, that protect that pile for for decades you know and that that's really one of the uh, main features of our you know of our pile repair uh, and, system and this next job do you know Tapir had how many paddles there were in the height of them well, the height of the height of them they're pretty tall these are about 12 meters or about roughly 40 feet or so. They were submerged, right? Yeah, they're all submerged. Yeah, they're all submerged. And as I was saying before, in, in some cases, they have 100% section loss, which this system that we have, I don't want to go over the formula for you, but we can actually calculate and show you that even when you have 100% section loss, whether it is a steel, timber, or concrete pile, we can restore the full capacity of that pile to its original strength you know, without uh, doing any welding or be, without uh, demolishing that that part, just on top of that, we can uh, strengthen. So that's what is going on in a lot of these parts. Yes. Yeah. How, how do we have a fast? I think it was like three of these a week or something. Yeah, yeah. The, the, well, I mean, they're pretty large piles. Yeah, yeah. They do. And with shear ropes going on and, and all this. And what we're doing, I mean, we're taking away welding. And yeah. although if you had three piles a week with some welding in there, that would take that. The welding know, is all, yeah. obviously welding is really a lot uh, slower than this system where you just tighten a bolt. So you know that that is uh, you know goes much faster. And, and like you were saying before, that there are some sites that don't even allow any welding. So that the to get welding could yeah. be pricey. Yeah. 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 So so that that's really uh, one of the 
things that, you know, we, we are doing now. Uh, how about uh, you, Josh, you know, what, what, what are you like something interesting? Uh -huh. Because by the way, I should tell you that a lot of you, especially if you're on the construction side, you probably call <laughs> Josh at all odd times because I know this poor guy gets calls in the middle of the midnight, you know, from Philippines or, you know, Australia or wherever in the world they're working on projects. So he can, uh, so he, he really knows a lot about the field installations and he can, you know, you see anything that we're doing now? Well, I mean, I've see everything pretty well on what goes in the projects and I've always enjoyed the one that you brought up. Uh, but I have one going on that's, it's a sensitive plant that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, but it's, they're trying out a couple piles with this system, which I know it's a great system. I know that they're going to like it. It's just, uh, I'm excited about it. And I had a sample of it with, where we inject, we use out timber. We will wrap our jacket tightly and inject um, a neat epoxy into the timbers. As you can see, it gets down to every nook and cranny. Now, the reason why I like it is just it, you can't see other uh, repairs out there where you can utilize the neat epoxy in timber. And I could see a lot of people see the advantages of that. Obviously, cementitious materials will not uh, get it to the timber. I think actually what we do design, but right, we're actually just doing the ring with right. the timber around it, right? Yeah. So at this point, when we're putting the LV in there, it's actually getting inside. You're not adding any volume to the pile. Um, and you're not utilizing also the shape of the jackets, right? Because we but, can but, bond but now we can. Yeah, because we're bonding to the jacket. Yeah, yeah. So, a... so we're now really utilizing the system. So it's unique. And I know that everywhere we've done it, it has been a, a great success. And people enjoy this system. So I have a client right now. I'm hoping they enjoy it right now. And, yeah. Uh, but I could, yeah, the sensitive quite, um, this, so, so yeah, this system that Josh is mentioning is, you know, normally being conservative, when we create our ring of pile medic around the pile and fill the annular space with concrete, we, to be conservative, we assume that that concrete, the, the shell, you know, the shell doesn't bond to that ring of concrete. So we ignore the vertical contribution of this uh, strengthened our pile medic shell. Oh so, yeah, these spacers. Yeah. But because the vertical bars, bars go in. Even the bar system, because now you got the hoop, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, typically, you know, like if you're using, normally, if you're going to be using concrete as the filling material, if you have a deteriorated part, we provide these spacers that come in different shapes and sizes. You snap, you know, like a few of these around the part, and then the rebars get snapped in place. You know, they just stay like that. You know, in place, you put, as many of these as needed. And then we, we create this shell around it, around the, like Josh was showing before, and we slide it over it. And so now, normally in our designs, we assume that the vertical capacity is enhanced by the ring of concrete and these FRP rebars. But then we don't need any ties around this because these jackets of pile medic, they become like this jacket that I'm holding, it's equivalent to, you know, in book direction, it's like having a number of four tie every four inch on center. So it's a lot of tie and we don't, therefore, we don't need to put any steel ties, which again, expedites, uh, you know, the process. However, when we, you know, we don't, in, in when we are using concrete, we don't assume that, you know, the hoop confinement of this we count on, but we don't rely on the strength of the, jacket in, in vertical load transfer. Now, with this case, you know, when, when we use the, you know, when we, if you are using the epoxy, you know, because epoxy bonds the jacket perfectly to the, to the original most part, now we can actually assume that this is an external reinforcement for the jacket or for the part, both in the hoop direction, as well as, you know, in vertically, for example, for uh, transferring the loads in, in bending. So that's really you know, a nice system. We have used this, in fact, and did a lot of testing with uh, the one of our uh, utility companies. So we use this a lot on timber utility poles, you know, nationwide, you know, when, when sometimes they get damaged during a storm or they just want to strengthen it. Uh, it when you paint it, you hide it. Yeah, and when once it's painted, you can really, you know, it just doesn't even... When here locally, we 
we try to go local all the time and we keep passing it and we painted it. And not anything that outside, it just looks like a normal utility pullback. Yeah, it's difficult uh, to, uh, to, to tell, you know, when, when you drive by that. that that's, uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that that one, uh, and I like it whenever somebody picks up on it. Uh, if, if, any, you know, any of the, uh, I, I should have told you that both Josh and I are known to be, we love to talk. <laughs> so, so we can go on for a long time, but, but we, we have to be mindful of the time. You know, we, we are trying to keep this podcast to half an hour. So if any of you have any questions, yeah, well, there, there, down, feel free to. Yeah. If anyone has any questions about like what we brought up or even maybe something that we have it, you guys can feel free. Uh, we can answer any questions that anyone has. Um, but so, you know, may, uh, I can maybe, uh, mention to you again, like these spaces that, that the nice thing about these spaces is that if you've been, you know, if you're familiar with, uh, some of the other pile repair systems, you know, you kind of have to guess where your rebar ultimately ends, uh, of being within that shell. But, you know, as engineers, we all really know, need, you know, and appreciate knowing the exact location of these rebars. And so these uh, spaces that, that we make, they not only allow us to know exactly the location of the rebar, but they also provide us a predetermined, uh, clear cover distance from the jacket. So the jacket is wrapped tightly touching the outside of this space that goes around very tightly. So and you're controlling tight. the annulus. Exactly, you control it. You know, we are, in fact, we're talking, I was talking to a port in uh, New Zealand this week. And these uh, folks, they have paper pods that are tapering larger diameter at the top and they become narrow as you get to the uh, seabed. So uh, they didn't want to use a uniform size shell because then you're filling a lot of concrete, you know, that, that doesn't do you any good. But with this system, once you these spaces around the jacket because these are just like a you know if this sticks out let's say two inches then you're ke keeping when you wrap the jacket around it in the field with our laminate we can maintain the same taper as the original part and go all the way down we, by the way this is what we do with like a lot we you know we do a lot of these cell phone towers in california well, the part i like though is what i was dealing with uh you know estimating it or even giving a boat out to a customer, you know, how do you determine the annulus space, control the annulus space? So yeah. you know, the timber, the timber goes, you know, you have a small size timber, large size timber. Uh, with our system, yeah, I mean, they're going to wrap tightly around the pile to the space. So if I'm over there calculating uh, the one, uh, yeah. the three, yeah, I mean, three inches, I, I can maybe a little bit more estimate the section loss, but I'm going to probably get a little bit closer than if I had a standard size shell, I said it's all for every pine. Yeah, and and really, in fact, you know, this client in New Zealand, they were, you know, they were unhappy with some of the previous repairs because the jackets, you know, and New Zealand is, you know, at the <laughs> other side of the world, so so they had made these jackets to a certain size, shipped it to New Zealand, and then once they get there, let's say if the jacket is oversized. You're not going to be able to return it. You end up filling it with concrete to fit, you know, to fill that void basically. And frankly, adding a thick layer of concrete doesn't get you anything. If anything, it adds a lot of dead weight to the system, and it basically reduces the capacity of the uh, your pile from taking additional live load. So, so that's really, um, you know, not not a you know, good solution. In in this case, you know, we can maintain that desired annular space throughout the height of the pile, and uh, the contractor also doesn't want to run out of ground. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. That, 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 that's now I, I'm just seeing it where obviously the ground is way underestimated, and and logistically out sites uh, just throws it on. So what this does is we're controlling it. Uh, yeah. The spacer size we get to dictate that man. We have, I, th I think I see a question in here. So let's see what, uh, you know, one of them. Uh... 
yeah, it says, you know, what are the key factors to consider when selecting the appropriate repair method and materials for different types of marine structures? Yeah, you know, so so really for for piles, you know, for example, let me just say maybe for like if you're focusing, for example, on piles, and we haven't really today, maybe we are not going to maybe have enough time to cover a lot of seawall or sheet pile repair, but let me just put you know, same kind of consideration goes into it because it's really these products that we have, they are engineered solution. It's not a one size fits all type of product. So let's say for piles, for example, you may have whether the choices are whether you have, you know, steel, timber, or concrete as the original pile, and then how much deterioration you have, you know, do you have 100% section loss or do you have 50%, 80% loss, well, whatever. Let's also mention three different build we design with. It's at the epoxy, the 320LV, which is just pure epoxy. Then we have an epoxy grout, cementitious grout, right? So these are the three that you're bringing up about. Yeah, and those are really... Okay. So ultimately, then, you know, then it becomes a matter of, you know, some of the other considerations, for example... Um, I was actually talking to a contractor in South Carolina last week that, you know, this is, uh, these are timber piles inside of a building. So clearly they prefer that, you know, they don't want to enlarge them so much. So in that case, for example, you know, maybe wrapping it tightly and injecting it with well, red lens. You know, from my point of view, I've seen a lot of reasons why I've seen it. I mean, obviously, a lot of cementitious projects, there's economics involved. Right. I mean, that's a big thing. Is, uh, when you see a lot of large projects, you know, timber, and you're just putting mass on it with, uh, to create a new pile, you're basically, uh, sometimes that's economics. Poxy grub can easily be fortunate to come with that. Cementitious yeah. So, obviously, if I'm dealing with a pile that has annual space, at least an inch or more, I'm like, okay, well, I would put a poxy in here. Or inch, let's say I would do a poxy because it is a kind of like version, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's epoxy. It's got the bonding capacity. It's the impermeability that people more bait off their way grout, even though grout will provide a certain amount. Um, but you know, like we say, economics is really one of it. so. So we look at it, and in in most cases, in most cases, especially for submerged piles where you know people usually like you know it's not visible so whether you increase the diameter by you know like two inch or four inch maybe it doesn't matter so much you know compared to like the cost might be of more interest to the owners so in those cases it you know we you know the, the lowest cost version would be to use a like about inch and a half to or longer larger annular space use an frp rebar and then fill in with the cementitious underwater grout. So it's, you know, it's a, a much lower cost overall to do it this way. Then the next one would be like Josh was saying that we make the annular space uh, tighter. And, but keep also in mind that if you're using an epoxy grout, you do need to have about intro stuff to get it. This is process for a lot. Half inch, people will design with, and it's hard to get half inch if your pile is deep. Yeah. I mean, if you put a port on, you have a, a nut on the backside that's preventing the flow. Right. right. So it, it's constructability. Of course, if you would have an edge on steel pipe pile, half inch would be, on, on, it would be the ideal thing to do. Our economics is what you, it's all you probably need. But, but getting the yeah, yeah, constructability has always been the issue. So I think it's been people designed that, but I think it's interesting have been where people landed and economics fly up as you get up. Yeah. So, I, I mean, as far as me, I, I've more seen people call in and ask for epoxy grout on steel type piles as epoxy grout. That's been that zone. Uh, I don't really see it too much on concrete. Most designs are cementitious grout, but um, I would say the reason why I hear about it too is it's just us or other design trips. Epoxy grout is, you know, saying at the beginning, they think that instead of going in a re epoxy and uh, coating on a steel pipe pile protecting it, they're actually doing a, a, a superior shield and sand, but still using an epoxy. Well, also, you know, again, you know, talking about constructability, because I know we were looking at this one project in the San Francisco Bay area, it was a 
seawall that they wanted to repair. I know we said we are not going to talk about seawalls, oh, but this thing is just... But if they build material. Yeah, it's, so, so like on that one, for example, one option that they were looking at was to paint it. It was a corroded seawall. So in order to paint underwater, you have to build a coffer dam, dewater that coffer dam, and then let it dry and clean the corroded sheet pile and then paint it. Well, you know, all of that expense compared to these solutions that we talk about here, which can be but all done on the product. Uh, yeah. yeah, up now here, you know, we, we are doing all of these things underwater. So there's no coffer dams, you know, no dewatering. And that, you know, ultimately that's really what saves, uh, you know, it makes it more economic. On, on my end, if on the film material, if it was up to me when I talked about timber, this, I would always try to put this on timber if I could. Same, Same thing though. A little bit more costly than doing a cementitious ring, but it is a it is a better fix, more long term. Uh, if you really think about it, but that when when it comes to film, it's just kind of the mentality behind it. I mean, yeah, they like most design, it's structural. I think there's those design criteria. So they need the sheer wraps. That increase, and we need we need any of us to put the sheer wraps in. And and yeah, you know, and that's really one of the things. You know, if there are. You know, we don't know if there are uh, engineers or contractors, what the majority or owners they are on this call. But but really, for like for our engineer colleagues, you don't need to worry about the design of this. We provide the design, and we will look at different options. You know, typically, what we ask from the engineers to provide, they usually have access to a survey of the structure. They have done probably some NDT uh, testing, and today, or they know how much thickness they have lost or if it is a you know corroded rebar that is corroded they have that information once that information is given to us you know we'll provide the design and pick the most economical alternative for that and then of course you know run it through the engineer of record you know who uh, who is ultimately responsible or dealing the sometimes sometimes we provide the package sometimes we're assisting yeah and both ways uh, so sometimes yeah, and a lot of these, you know, the you know the owners just come to us directly. But if they already have an engineer, like you know, we work with some of these larger, you know, marine engineering firms that they have clients, and then you know the the project may be a lot. You know, like let's say for example, you might be um, enlarging a or, or making some major improvements to a port, which has so many other aspects to it, which is far, you know, beyond what we can do for our limited scope of work deals with the submerged you know, piles or, or if it is the deck that we have to strengthen or the seawall and that part of it. But then the overall scope of the project that the engineer of record handles is a lot more extensive and we can feed them with, with that. Uh, is there any more questions or if, if uh, maybe we kind of just bring up next week. I don't think you're going to, or next week. Next, yeah, week next month, you know, I, I should tell you, I, I, I had my, this is a rare thing for me, but I am taking a vacation off. I will be bicycling on, on Amalfi Coast in Italy. <laughs> so the time of this thing would be around like 6, 7 p.m. in Italy. So who knows? Maybe I'll be able to join you, you know, from uh, the, the hotel out there. And, I, you know, but I know if I'll I'm here. Josh, yeah. will, Josh will be here. Yeah, uh, I'm going to chime with you. A glass of wine in hand from Italy the next week. <laughs> We're doing this the first Thursday of every month, just covering different topics and solutions that we have. So just keep an eye out. Um, we'll be yeah. regarding them, posting them on our socials. So we're excited and hopefully, you know, build this. And we appreciate yeah, all the thing really is that, you know, uh, somehow between these, we want to add additional uh, podcasts and webinars to talk about, for example, you know, a whole host of pipe repair solutions as some of you may be aware of, but we want to include, you know, another series, uh, maybe every, you know, the third Thursday or something like that in between. But again, keep an eye open. We're going to be the next one though. Including, so I'll be in the next one yeah. and uh, maybe have an estimator with me. Yeah. Um, the, the next one I had correct me if I'm wrong is we're going to kind of break down the pile that uh, maybe some, uh, items about the estimating portion of it or they could just use of that. That also, but but also, you know, those of you who are here today, 
If you'd like to email us or put in the chat, yeah, what would you like us to, to talk? So that, that was the, kind of the idea. I think some of you might have questions behind the system too, or hey, how it could and all down uh, with the RS meter. We could kind of go back and forth about how we have looked at these projects, you know, speed, the, the economics, and you know, just how it works, just kind of be grasping your head around this. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, if there's any. Any requests to tell them? Glad to uh, add that in there. I yeah. think we've got a minute over, so we should say thank you all of you for attending today. And you know, we hope you got something of value out of it and look forward to seeing you on the future yeah. podcast. Thank you. Guys, um, see you next month. And yeah, feel free to, you know, comment on our social media posts, email info at quakegraph.com if you have any requests of what we want to talk about and we look forward to it. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.